Hey folks, it's Michael with the CCERP podcast, Cypress Creek Ecological Restoration Project. Hope you're doing well. Um, we're back again. Today we're going to talk about the Texas Master Naturalist Program. Um, it's something that some folks might want to get involved in, learn more about the area, um, but just a general discussion will be interesting for folks, I think. But we're going to talk about that with the one and only, the inimitable, the not to be iterated or iterated, Terry MacArthur. Terry, will you introduce yourself, please? Oh, what an introduction you've already given. <laughs> <laughs> How can I talk that? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, yes, I'm Terry MacArthur. I've been a Texas Master Naturalist, certified Texas Master Naturalist since 2001. Um, continually certified every year. Well, back when you were um, 19 years old? Dang. Exactly right, yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, other things that uh, your audience may care to know when I try to say anything about nature and natural resources uh, in, this, in this area Um <clears throat> I'm also certified as a Texas water specialist. I'm certified as a trainer for volunteer water quality monitors. Um, I'm a certified master volunteer entomology specialist. I am also certified as a facilitator for a number of environmental education programs, um, Leopold Education Project, um, hmm. Project Learning Tree, Project Wild, others. So I've spent quite a bit of time in my life learning about nature, both through programs and on my own. I, I, I remember when I was probably, I don't know, five or six years old, we moved into a neighborhood that was only partially completed, and my days were spent when I wasn't in school out exploring the neighborhood where there were still vacant lots and cool. picking up bugs and rocks and looking at trees. So um, it's a lifelong interest on my part. Cool. And you say you're a certified etymologist. What's this etymology thing? It, um, it's a program that um, AgriLife Extension runs called Master Volunteer Entomology Specialist. It's a three-day course um, okay. to learn more about Entomology, uh, roles of insects in nature, um, both bad and good. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. Humans tend to categorize whether things are good or bad depending on how they perceive they're affecting their lives. So some bugs are considered bad bugs because we don't like them in our homes or you know, in, involved in what we're doing. So um, I like to take a different view that, you know, everybody's got to be someplace, and and they all have a role to play in nature. And how do we know what that role is until they're gone? Mm -hmm. And then we find out other bad things happen because that particular organism isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. So entomology is the study of insects? Yes. Cool. Um, and uh, you've been interested in education, I mean, biology and the outdoors, like, informally a lot. What about formal education? None. No? Cool. So you, didn't go, you, I, didn't, no. you didn't go to high school? It was a... Oh, yeah. I did. Oh, but dang it. I was my, hoping you didn't. That would have been so cool. <laughs> like Abraham my, Lincoln. <laughs> my interest in nature has been personal and, and very dear to me from really early childhood. What so, about Leopold? I've, you know, Did Leopold go to college or anything? Oh, my gosh, yeah. He did? He, he started uh, the forestry program, hmm. uh, especially here in Texas. Aldo Leopold is considered the father of forestry in the state of Texas, hmm. uh, even oh. though this is not where he's from. Yeah, hmm. didn't know that. Huh. Cool. So he has a very strong connection with Texas. 
Yes, he, he was a professor forever, hmm. um, teaching forestry and other related topics. So. Yeah, I guess some he, folks, he's unfortunately. He's a pretty interesting guy, yeah. Hmm. And Thoreau, um, so, Thoreau, Thoreau was highly educated, too. Yes. And I find his writing uh, a little softer, gentler than Leopold. Leopold is kind of in your face about making bad decisions, um, hmm. I find. And I think that sometimes his writings can be more of a wake-up call for those who read them. Mm -hmm. hmm. And Thoreau's dense, really, really dense. It's like, yeah. to, to really get it, you really got to get into it. You do have to spend some time with it, but let's face it. I mean, he isolated himself for periods of time so that his focus became pinpoint on what he was thinking, studying, seeing. <clears throat> and uh, it takes that concentration to to end up writing the things that he wrote. So you mm. have to admire both. And plus he was like... Um educated and he knew about ancient history from all kinds of different cultures which he brings into play and Walden Chinese um, European um, African I think all these other different places and there's some all this mythology um, so a lot of stuff people can miss without and like not understand without knowing some of this background. I went over it with someone like uh, last summer, 2018, and yeah, I was amazed at how deep and philosophical and it is and how much history is involved in it. You know, he was a classical scholar and it shows. Um, so you can read it on different levels, but to really get it, it's like, it takes a lot of study. Yes, that's a deep dive. Yeah. It really is. And, a, and quite a time commitment. But. Um, so other things that I think perhaps your listeners might be interested in knowing about the Texas Master Naturalist Program. Um, going to its roots, the purpose of the program is to develop a core of well-trained volunteers who then can work on any number, any variety of programs, projects related to natural resources, things like, you know, protection and conservation and re reforestation. I mean, restoring nature where it can be and protecting and preserving it where, where it is mm -hmm. are some of the main things. I, I think the program is best defined by considering some of the kinds of projects and programs that master naturalists get involved in. I mean, I think of Brazos Bend State Park. The educational programs there are pretty much entirely under the purview of being developed and implemented by a group of master naturalist volunteers there. Oh, hmm. Up at Lake Livingston. Uh, the Master Naturalist chapter there, along with some volunteers from other Master Naturalist chapters in the area, are working on that very large um, aquatic vegetation restoration program. Uh, these are these are programs that probably simply would not exist without this dedicated group of volunteers to to get involved create the program, and then manage them. All, all over the state, there are examples of, of that. And a lot of them are um, where the chapter becomes associated with a nearby park, state park, hmm. city park, um, mm -hmm. and cr help create those kinds of educational opportunities. It's, you know, it's funny to me that we, we talk about these educational opportunities in places, and yet, especially for youth who participate, it's more of a fun, enjoyable outing experience.
experience of the mm-hmm. kind that maybe most families don't have the time or interest or the knowledge to do on their own anymore. And they go to a park and they enjoy this activity um, and they walk away having learned something and didn't even realize it. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of beauty of that is, to me, whether you're an adult or a child, I find you learn something new that kind of took over your mind and you enjoyed it so much. The first thing you want to do is tell someone else about it. Hey, did you know? And and you go on to tell them what you learned, which mm-hmm. I think is another wonderful aspect of this program as people come into the program and learn about more about nature and its processes it's a natural tendency to want to share what you learn so Mm. i think that's helped with the expansion of the program over the years it's the first chapter i think began in 1997 or 98 over Mm. in the san antonio austin area and um and has expanded to now, I think there are somewhere between 45 and 50 chapters. Most are county-based, although in some of the more rural areas, one chapter may cover multiple counties. Mm-hmm. I think up in the Panhandle, there's one chapter that's seven or eight counties that they cover because there just aren't that many folks. Um, here, in the Houston area, Harris County has one chapter. Um, Montgomery County has one chapter, but we also cover Walker County. Um, we used to cover both Liberty and Grimes County, but those counties now have established chapters. Cool. Um, Grimes County, I, I think, covers two or three counties now. So yeah. the, the program has grown well over these past 20-some years. And why did it start out in the first place? Do you know what the motive was or anything? Well, it it's a collaboration at the state level between the AgriLife Extension Service and Texas Parks and Wildlife. Hmm. And just as I mentioned about Brazos Bend, there are, you know, state parks and other organizations, uh, agencies that needed programs to to happen and didn't have the funding to pay staff to do it and um, Mm. it seemed a natural progression for them to train some volunteers find identify Mm. volunteers train them and then let them help with the program Mm. Um, especially at state parks uh, texas parks and wildlife utilizes volunteers to a very great extent to run programs Mm. okay that makes sense. It makes sense why it would spread also. Yeah. And what are some of the things that um, they're doing at Brass Bend? You got some specifics? Um, so they run birding programs. They run alligator watch programs. <laughs> they do um, wetland studies. Uh, they uh, teach about native grasses. Um they do fishing down there. Um, it's it's a huge variety yeah. of things that okay. happen down there. Um, so, they've so got all kinds of programs. So they'll take people out um, yes. to try to find birds, and then they'll do kind of like citizen science studies? Exactly. Okay. And they do also, as we do here in Montgomery County, they do also uh, invite school groups to come out for field studies and run those kind of programs as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Here in Montgomery County, this this past year, well, so let me back up and say, you know, we all have our personal interests that um, we find niches for and find ways to volunteer, but as a chapter, um, there, there are usually several fairly large projects every year that are taken on Some members of our Montgomery County chapter, which is called Heartwood, by the way, um, volunteer on that Lake Livingston restoration program that I I mentioned. Uh, Earlier, in back in April and May, there were um, about 
20 of the chapter members who came and trained and assisted with uh, aquatic field studies for 1,198 fifth graders Hmm. uh, out at Bear Branch Recreation Center uh, on Bear Branch, on the creek itself. Um, That was, you know, days and days and days of groups of fifth graders coming out. And we studied macroinvertebrates and how they are indicator species of water quality. Um, we learned about local common fish and their role in the aquatic food web and how they are indicator species. We talked about uh, how watersheds work. Um, the kids all got to make uh, their own watershed out of washable markers and some heavy weight paper and then spray bottles of water to make it rain on the watershed to see hmm. what happened. It was that was a lot of fun. We hmm. talked about water conservation. Um, how much water does it take to do this or that or the hmm. other and um, how we can personally help reduce wasting water as a conservation measure. Um, those kinds of things. So uh, it, it was it was a very successful year. Good. Highly popular with fifth grade science teachers. So we, I think we already have nearly, nearly two weeks of dates already set for this coming April. Cool. Uh, some of the schools have already booked their field study dates. So um, cool. we're looking forward to that, and the training for volunteers for that will begin right after the first of the year. Cool. Um, further on into the year, long around May or so, April, May, uh, we invited uh, Dr. Hans Landel from Labor Johnson Wildflower Center, who's uh, the director of the Invaders of Texas program, to come down and do a training for volunteers who wanted to get uh, involved in helping remove invasive species from some of the pathways and green belts in the woodland in the township. And uh, so that program ended up being, we spent about 400 hours uh, this year removing invasive species from along paths and parkways. And that goes back to what I was talking about earlier. So it began with master naturalists out on the pathways and trails. Uh, we, uh, I didn't mention that I work for Woodlands Township as the water conservation specialist. And so it was a it was a collaboration. In fact, the earlier one on field studies uh, it was a collaboration between our environmental services department of the township and the master naturalist chapter, and in all cases expanded out to additional people. So in the case of the invasives program, uh, people from the neighborhoods would see these volunteers wearing vests that said they were township volunteers out on the pathway and would stop to ask what they were doing. Hmm. And uh, cool. that natural progression happened so that by the end of this year, just about as many community and neighborhood residents as master naturalists were involved in removing invasive species from the green belt of pathway. Cool. So, uh, That program, as I said, has resulted in about 400 hours so far, and um, it's difficult to measure the amount of invasive material that they remove. Um, We use like 45 or 55 gallon trash bags to carry it out in because it has to go to the landfill. We don't want it in compost piles. So Mm -hmm. um, from that respect, it's about 3,000 gallons of plant material, um, air potato vines, mandina, Japanese climbing fern, elephant ears, um, privet, Chinese privet, um, all of those things being removed. There was a big emphasis on air potato vine this year because uh, we were losing trees along some of our green belts here in the township to air potato vines. They simply smothered the trees out and weren't allowing them to get enough sunlight, and the trees were suffering for it. So there have been a number of places where the trees had to be 
removed and new trees planted in their place by the time we got the air potatoes out of there. Well, so you gave some examples of invasive species and there's Chinese tallow also, but what is an invasive species? Like how is that defined and like, what does it mean? So according to federal law, an invasive species is a non-native that either causes harm or has the potential to cause harm either to the environment or economically or both or to human health. Mm -hmm. So there is a legal definition for invasive species, hmm. which is not to say that there aren't some native species that can become aggressive and get out of control. There are, but they're not considered invasive because they are native. They're just mm -hmm. out of control in the area where they are. And, um, the, and, and there's where the difference lies. Uh, invasive species have this federal regulation attached to them so that some um, actually become illegal to buy, sell, even possess. And um, they, because they have such economic ramifications, I think, for example, like the zebra mussels that are mm. invading more and more waterways and have moved into Texas and are now mm. a serious problem for um, lakes and rivers in Texas. And the apple snail. Yeah, we haven't seen that right in our area yet. No Good. doubt it will arrive here, but we haven't seen it as much. Emerald ash borer is another that uh, is in Texas. We haven't seen it here yet, but um, it's expected to expand its field. I mean, some things, regardless of their size, are just more difficult to uh, detect until it's in your face. You know, yeah. it's already mm -hmm. doing damage. So there are, there are a lot. But um, And, you know, air potato vine, I mean, I get it. Japanese climbing ferns, some of these other plants they're gorgeous plants they're beautiful mm -hmm. and in their home environment they're under control by insects and diseases and soil limitations but when you move something out of its natural environment into a new place um, that's when problems can happen because the controls don't come with it Mm -hmm. um, you don't bring the insects and the diseases with it. You just bring the plant or the animal. And then when it releases into the wild, there's there's no nothing to stop it. So it can outcompete for nutrients and sunlight, um, and it can take over. It, it can choke out native plants in a way that is very detrimental to the environment. Yeah, and you, could, you can't really bring over some controls because to – do that you got to be holistic you can't in biology you can't take a thing divorced from everything else you have to bring over the whole entire ecology from one area to this new area and then you're changing everything then it's no longer the same area um and you know i mean this goes back our our roots in, in america are that um you know settlers arrived and they wanted that feel of home so they brought plants and animals with them that they were used to mm -hmm. and introduced them to their new place because they didn't find any of those things from home there. And uh, most adapted and are fine, mm -hmm. but it's the few who aren't fine mm -hmm. that cause the problem. Yeah. So there's um, native as one category, invasive another, and then biocompatible another like uh well adapted yeah well adapted i think like isn't um chinese elm more biocompatible and not invasive i don't know about chinese elm i think more of um earthworm you know we didn't have earthworms here until hmm. they were brought over hmm. uh, but they are they're very helpful <laughs> for the environment they're great environmental engineers they mm -hmm. They do good things for soil and aeration and um, plant selection. I mean, they they grow the plants they like to eat, and they inhibit the growth of plants that they don't like, which 
often mm-hmm. works in our favor. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think the Chinese elm were brought over because of um, elm disease, what Dutch elm yeah. disease, I think, um, mm-hmm. and it's uh, immune to that. And so they were planted to help replenish some of the elm population. Um, mm-hmm. And from so far as I'm aware, they're not invasive. But, good uh, to know. Um, and then we got the calorie pear, but I forget if that's a problem or not. Um, I was thinking maybe it isn't, but I think I maybe I read some stuff where calorie pear can be a problem, where it might be overgrowing some areas. So but. sometimes things don't have to be invasive still to be a problem. Hmm. What can happen is... Uh, native species of organisms evolve with native species of organisms. And so you introduce a new pear tree and it flowers and it attracts bees, let's say, which is good for that tree, but bad for the native trees that the bee is not visiting. And suddenly you have an imbalance. <laughs> so it, it's still about natural processes. Mm-hmm. Um, when you when you introduce non-native plants into an environment, into an ecosystem, um, they do the same things as the native plants do as far as losing leaves, um, what they exude into the soil, it's can change the decomposing community that's in the soil, or, you know, what microbes are making up that decomposing community um, to adapt to this new um, plant and uh, its, its leaves that are trying to be decomposed. It can actually, if there are enough of the non-native plants, it can actually even cause some um, members of that decomposing community to not have what they need and we lose them so that uh, it it becomes more difficult if then we lose the non-native plants for some reason a disease comes in and takes them away now we have a less diverse decomposing community to act on what is there and what is left even if the natives begin to come back it's a long, slow slog to get back to balance again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot to biology. Um, <laughs> there is a lot. There's a lot to nature. <laughs> yeah. Like, calculus is easy. Biology is complex. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on your point of view, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> you being the mathematician, you would think that. <laughs> That's funny. But, uh, yeah, so that's some things folks often don't seem to consider, like uh, you bring in something and the bees go to this plant instead and how that affects everything else, how the effects yes. wrinkle out and the ripples spread through time. Yeah. And don't consider the decomposers and how important they are and how that feeds back on the system. Um as, as some people say, um, life as we know it depends on death. We cannot have the exactly. world and the ecology we have without death and that regeneration. Yeah, yeah. But you know, death in and of itself isn't that helpful without a way, <laughs> and nature has found the way or several ways to turn that dead material back into life for something new. And mm-hmm. that's really what it's about. Yeah. Um, you know, another project that uh, the chapter got involved in this year, the Hartwood chapter here, was another collaboration with the Woodlands Township. Um, so I, I don't know if you're aware that a couple of years ago, the, the board of directors of the township uh, passed a resolution that uh, we would try our best to become a monarch champion city by supporting an initiative to increase 
pollinator habitat within the township. Cool. And so for a couple of years, we've worked on getting folks to um, plant more native plants, especially plants that provide food for adult butterflies, as well as host plants for um, the larval stages. And so blooming plants of uh, native varieties have increased, but we were still having difficulty getting milkweed in, out there in the community mixed in these pollinator gardens hmm. so that the monarch butterflies had host plants. So earlier this year, the Environmental Services Department once again collaborated with Texas Master Naturalist here in the Hartwood chapter, as well as um, Nature's Way Resources up on 1488. And um, we, they provided, Nature's Way provided space and some manpower and quite a bit of the supplies. And um, the township purchased uh, milkweed seeds and the Master Naturalist uh, came to a training day and got involved in helping us plant the seeds, uh, tend to them, uh, keep them healthy, grow them out. We ended up with more than 13,000 pots of milkweed. Hmm. Cool. And it's in seedling sizes. And then our department began a giveaway program so that people who had pollinator gardens and wanted to increase the value for monarch butterflies could come and collect for free half a dozen milkweed seedlings cool. to plant into their garden. And um, we, through right at the end of November, had gotten all of those milkweed seedlings out into the the community so we're hoping that next spring when those milkweed plants they go dormant for the winter in fact if you look for them right now you you probably couldn't find a single one of them (laughs) that was planted Mm -hmm. because they go dormant Mm -hmm. but in the spring as soon as it begins to warm and those milkweed plants uh, begin putting out new sprouts and new leaves and growing uh, we hope that they will get well enough established that by spring and again in fall by uh, monarch migration pattern time that we'll see uh, an uptick in the number of monarch butterflies because we've given them the the host plants for the larva Hmm. yeah nice so that was that was another 400 hour volunteer project Hmm. and was very successful cool one thing folks ought to do sometime is we consider that stuff, but they ought to have some programs for, you know, I knew people can do this at home to have some programs to um, help mushrooms because um, they're important decomposers, um, get some of them propagated and in the environment um, around because um, isn't, Aren't mushrooms a sign of healthy soil? Well, yes and no. Um, And propagating them is problematic. Uh, (laughs) So mushrooms, (laughs) mushrooms, they, uh, mushrooms have been found in the fossil records from back at least 400 million years. So they've been around a while. There are those who believe that we only have terrestrial plants because of mushrooms. Hmm. It was, you know, the first algae that washed up on the seashore, the the fungi that were in the soil enabled them to get nutrients to be able to survive in a terrestrial environment Mm -hmm. and begin to grow. And the same is true today, especially in forested areas. The different fungi, they have different functions in, in the soil, but the different fungi are either busy decomposing uh, the dead matter so that they're recycling the nutrients back into the soil to make them bioavailable for the living vegetation, or they may be 
creating a network that connects all the vegetation in the forest Mm -hmm. so those nutrients and even water even moisture can move around to places that it's needed and help create a healthier soil healthier environment for all the things that live there Mm -hmm. so the problem with propagation is some especially the the more microscopic fungi that grow within the plant, within the roots, within the plants themselves to help facilitate that nutrient recycling, they have rather specific partners, specific Mm -hmm. plant partners. And so it's just as we talked about a while ago with invasive plants. If you want to take these fungi from the soil and propagate them, you have to have everything that's where they are for them to grow. You can't just take the fungi and throw them on some you know, <laughs> yeah. brown rice substrate and they're going to grow. They have to have that plant so they exchange those nutrients um, for the fungi to do well. And the plant has to do well to provide it. So it's complex. It's, uh, it's, that, uh, <laughs> it's that calculus thing again, you know. Yeah. There's a complexity there that makes it difficult. In fact, most all the mushrooms that are cultivated, the ones you can buy, are all the saprophytes. They're all the decomposers hmm. because they are more generalist. They're less uh, hmm. specialist when it comes to their their plants that, that they are able to partner with. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting that uh, the folks look into it that... Some plants and trees and interact with fungus, and so the vegetation gives the fungus carbohydrates, and then the fungus gives the plant some minerals and nutrition. It's a yes, interesting. That's, that's yeah, so there's a lot of symbiosis involved there. Not everything is yes. competition. Cooperation is a important and neglected aspect of evolution and biology. It is, and although competition does exist in that environment mm-hmm. and it can mm-hmm. sometimes because sometimes the role of a fungus in relation to a plant is antifungal it keeps other fungi that would be detrimental from invading that plant there are parasitic fungi as well as saprophytic and yeah. mm-hmm. you know so it it's complex <laughs> it really is complex, what they do and how they do it. Uh, you know, here the number of fungi is just mind-boggling. Here's an example. Yeah. If you could see, if you could see all the tens of millions of spores released into the air every single year by mushrooms, and all those spores were in one place, the surface area would be just about equal to the land mass of the co- continent of Africa. Hmm. So wow. it's a huge, huge amount of fungal spores that are in the air all the time, every minute of every day. And speaking of which, and, yeah, like folks, because we don't learn enough about biology and we're not as in touch with nature, people kind of lose sight of it. But we have bacteria and fungus all over our skin all the time. We breathe it in and we need it. It's not a negative thing. Some things are negative, yeah, but there's also the symbiotic um, relationships between them and us. We need some of that um, in order to survive and thrive. Exactly. And a healthy body, if if we're healthy, the few that are uh, negative for us, we combat. They don't interfere with our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, a weakened immune system is a, I mean, it, it can be a death knell for folks um, because of all the viruses and bacteria and fungi that are out there. So mm-hmm. it, it, I keep saying it, it's complex, Michael. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so those are some of the things that the program does. Um, yeah. And what's the training like if someone's interested in doing um, training? for 
Take so to become a master naturalist. Do we get, wait, required. so it's master naturalist. So is there a like um, T A N P and like a T W N P, like a Texas wannabe naturalist program, and then a Texas amateur naturalist program, or apprentice, and then Texas master naturalist, or what? <laughs> it's like that. So to become <laughs> a master naturalist, first. You have to attend a minimum of 40 hours of approved training in a rather formalized um, training session um, in the um, Hartwood chapter here in Montgomery County. We do our trainings on about two Saturdays a month from March through July, sometimes into early August. Hmm. Um, we make sure that there's plenty more than 40 hours of training available. So if push came to shove and you had to miss a class and simply could not make it up, you could still get 40 hours of training. Hmm. Um, and you must also find an additional eight hours of, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you must serve 40 hours of volunteer service. And it can happen during, you can start volunteering during the time you're doing your initial training or um, at any point um, afterwards up to, say, 15 months from the time training starts hmm. to get your 40 hours of training in. And then you also must find an additional eight hours of what's considered advanced training. It's outside the primary training uh, time on your own uh, to kind of expand on knowledge of any of the topics that you're learning about. And when you've done all of those hours, you get initial certification as a master naturalist. Hmm. So during that period, you know, you're a master naturalist in training or an intern, however you want to view it. Um, but if you never accomplish all of those things to get certified, um, then, yeah, you've learned something. It's been a personal enrichment experience, but perhaps you never get certified as a master naturalist. But let's say you do, and the next year then, beginning with the calendar year after your initial certification, then the requirements to maintain certification are 40 hours of annual volunteer service and eight hours of additional training on your own. If you don't accomplish that, after initial certification, you still are a Texas master naturalist. You're just not certified hmm. after that. Okay. Hmm. But you can come back the following year, circumstances change, and you are able to complete those hours, then you're that year you're certified again so you can yes you can move back and forth in the system after initial certification though you're always a Texas master hmm. okay, cool. you may not say that you're certified unless you've accomplished those um, minimum requirements every year hmm. okay and then um, in the training program itself um, those at least 40 hours what all is what all is involved and what do people study and What's taught? What do people so do? So it's, it's a broad scope of topics related to natural resources. We do study forestry and um, ecology, um, water, aquatic environments, um, geology. Uh, we study mammalogy, a lot of the ologies, um, mm -hmm. um, entomology. So it's it's a really broad scope of topics related to natural resources. Um, advanced training, those outside those initial 40 or so hours of initial training, the primary training, can relate to more specific um, focused areas of natural resources, but still needs to be natural resources. Um, volunteering has to be related to projects and programs that benefit natural resources and the environment in some way. So there are uh, all of all of the training hours and volunteering hours 
go through a, a, a simple approval process within each chapter, and each chapter topics relate to their own region hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. For example, out here in Montgomery County, we spend virtually no time studying coastal ecology. It's, we don't have coastal ecology. Or we deserts. don't learn how to you know, we don't learn how to measure the conductivity of salt water mm -hmm. because we don't have salt water. Mm -hmm. So And are there tests or during the program, the forty hours, or is there a test like an exam at the end or what? No. Okay. There is not. Um there is some, there's been discussion off and on over the years about whether there should be some qualifying tests. You know, the, the program began here in Texas as the Texas Master Naturalist Program, but was so wildly popular, you, you pardon the pun there, um, that um, a lot of other states have taken it up. And there hmm, are, cool. uh, in other states, sometimes the uh, university with which the the program is associated does require um, a, a test hmm. to be done to, to qualify. Um, those programs tend to be uh, quite a bit more expensive as well. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Here, uh, here in Texas, the tuition for the primary training tends to run anywhere from seventy-five to one hundred fifty dollars, depending on the chapter and the and what's included. Here in Montgomery County, our tuition is 150, but um, it in, it includes the, the uh, state's curriculum guide. Um, it's a huge book that has some basic information that covers all the regions in the in the state on all those topics um, that I mentioned and more. Uh, it also includes um, a master naturalist polo shirt upon sort of um, all the materials, handout materials and such that the class needs. Um, so, and um, all the instruction. So it's it's actually a pretty good bargain. The mm -hmm. chapter pretty much spends what it charges in tuition by the time the classes are completed. And um, for example, up in Oregon, I was talking to a friend up there who had moved from Texas as a master naturalist. And the, I forget which university it's associated with there, but it's a $350 course, and you have to complete it as a college course online hmm. um, and pass a test to get certified as a master naturalist in Oregon. So hmm. um, different, different plans, different states, even the various counties in, in Texas, you know, the programs can be run a little bit differently depending on what the region you're in and where um, where your natural resources lie. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, what might folks do in, let's say, like a, is there like a botany section? Yes. And what might happen in, is that like one day or so, like what? Um, well, this past year, for example, the botany was divided into two different days of, of training. Um, one of our longtime and founding members is Anita Tiller with Mercer Botanic Garden. Hmm. And she has um, been our primary instructor for botany for, for ever since the, this chapter began uh, in 2005 here in Montgomery County. And um, it's typically a minimum four to six hours of training because it starts at the start and learns the different parts of plants, um, the different families of plants. Um, often she will bring in blooming plants and the flowers are dissected to learn the various parts. Um, it generally involves uh, pretty in-depth study of what plants do all day. I mean, what do we get from plants? How do they serve us? Mm -hmm. Since, you know, we're, we humans tend to value everything based on what has it done for me lately, 
<laughs> um, a lot of it talks, a lot of it is about what plants actually do for ecosystems. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so um, it's often held at Mercer Botanic Garden <laughs> and generally ends up with a tour of the native plant gardens there, the endangered species garden, um, often includes um, an opportunity to visit the herbarium. Uh, they, uh, Mercer inherited the the herbarium from, um, oh, the down in Spring Branch, the the place that closed down that had the huge herbarium. Hmm. Um, hmm. Not sure. The, hmm. I, I forget the name of it now. Sorry. But uh, so they have spent the last couple of three years um, getting that herbarium cataloged and creating a library, uh, doing some updates on the information, and it's housed in a building right next to Mercer. Uh, they're on Alding Westfield now. And uh, some of our master naturalists from Hartwood, as well as some from um, the Harris County chapter, and then some uh, volunteers who are interested in botany but are not master naturalists all volunteer there to help maintain that herbarium hmm. so it's um it's, it's pretty it's a pretty fascinating day of study um and as i said this past year it was divided into two days two shorter days um uh, one day had some other topics combined with it so mm-hmm. it's pretty in-depth and people learn what some of the main invasive species are in contrast to the natural species in that Yes, there is a, quite a segment on invasive species, and then um, and then we do do trainings with uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center and Inva- hmm. Invaders of Texas program twice a year as a rule. Um, the springtime one is generally longer, um, six hours or so. Um, it's coming up again February fifteenth. Uh, the next training is coming up again February fifteenth, and then in the fall. Um, late summer or early fall uh, is the Sentinel Pest Network training, which concentrates more on invasive uh, animals than on vegetation. Hmm. And I believe that one is scheduled for the first Saturday in April. I I mean, in August, I believe. Um, So we do spend some time helping uh, folks learn more about why invasive can be problematic. And that February 15, 2020 thing, would that be for like, toward like continuing education credits kind of sort of for maintaining certification? For master naturalists, yes. Yeah. Yes, for maintaining certification, yes, as well as leading to volunteering <laughs> opportunities. The, the township, our environmental services department, is sponsoring that this year. It's going to be in the Hark building, H-A-R-C building at... Um, 8801 Gosling, and um, anyone can contact me if they would be interested in that. But we're inviting um, not just master naturalists. We're inviting residents of the woodlands who are interested in participating in that invasive removal program to come out and get trained and uh, help us expand that program this year. There's certainly no shortage of invasive plants along the green belts and park mm-hmm. pathways in um, in the woodland. Yeah, so. and then plenty along Cypress Creek too. Absolutely. So, I mean, you would be welcome to invite folks that are in your area to come cool. up and join with us or uh, contact Lady Bird Johnson and set up your own training. Hmm, true. Yeah, good point. Thanks. Hadn't thought of that. Um, and then in the botany, do people learn to recognize leaves and like... Absolutely. And so you recognize all the, all the parts of plants yeah. and re- recognize like a tree by the shape of its leaf. Do you go over that? Yes. Cool. Yeah. All, all <laughs> aspects of parts of vegetation are covered. And um, there's, uh, and we do do a, quite a bit of, like I said, we, we go out and visit the garden so that we can apply what we just learned from a sketch or a, you know, a slide or whatever go out and take a look at that. You know, I quote Albert Einstein, information is not knowledge. I mean, (laughs) we can say an oak leaf looks like this and show a picture of something. Well, that's information. 
until you go out there and touch that oak tree and touch that leaf and look at the oak in its setting and see who lives with it and how they interact. Now you know the oak tree a lot, lot better. So, um, yes, there's a lot of time spent in the field applying what you learn in the way of information. Yeah, there's a good scene in the movie Infinity about Richard Feynman in his early part of his life. He's out with his dad somewhere, and he asks his dad, what's the name of that bird? And his dad says, I could tell you the name of that bird in all kinds of different languages, but then all you know is the name of the bird. And he says, you know, you don't just want to know the name. You got to look at the bird. You got to watch the bird. You need to listen to the bird. You need to think about what it does. Yeah, kind of same thing. That was a great scene. I which love that. The, yep, which is the wonderful part about nature. Yeah. Because nothing, as you said earlier, nothing exists in a vacuum. Everything is connected to everything else. And mm -hmm. if we took that bird out of an ecosystem, what goes wrong? We never think about that. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I I I go back to Aldo Leopold and his uh, description of in his younger days when he he and his companions shot the mother wolf and her pups because he thought if he got rid of predators in the park it would mean there would be more deer. And later in life he realized that it it changes things. Yeah. The lack of predators means more deer, but it means more deer than the environment can support. And it's not a good thing that there are no predators. Yeah, instead of predators so, going after some of the deer, then you have deer starving to death. Um, or diseased. Yeah, all kinds of like horrible things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly so. So, yeah, it's, it's about understanding mm. more than just a name of something. It's about getting to know it. It's more than information. It's more about knowledge. And then in like a class about mammals, you get out and actually look at some tracks and learn to recognize different animal tracks? Often, um, often there's quite a long, you know, walk along a trail to, to look for tracks, but to also look for signs to look for nests, to look for dens, to look for other uh, signs of habitat. Um, um, it's, it's difficult to study animals in the wild because they hear you coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it comes down more to learning about them, what they do, how they do it, where they live, how they affect the ecosystem, rather than actually glimpsing the animal because they just won't stay in one place. And that depends in part how people move. Um, yeah. A lot of modern people are very noisy and clumsy. Don't we don't a lot of them don't move at all as people did like 200 years ago or a thousand years ago. So if you do that, you learn more like restore your natural human movement, just like restoring the ecology, then you'll move a lot quieter, be a lot more mindful and attentive and um, you'd be surprised at what you can do. Like there's a guy, um, Tom Brown the third, um, the son of the famous tracker Tom Brown, but Tom Brown the third does yeah. it as well. And mm -hmm. um, he teaches out in Portland, I think. Um, I forget the name of his school right now, but I've maybe I'll put a link in a show notes to a podcast interview I did of him on another podcast I do. But he's talked about how um, he can move really slowly and he's able to move so that he can get up close and touch a deer. That's wonderful. That takes I'm, patience I've and gotten control. very close to deer, but, but I've never actually reached out to touch one before. He's, and it's a, it, you're right. It's difficult to be still, mm -hmm. not just quiet, but still. And uh, you, you can see a lot more if you can learn to be quiet and still for a time. I, I think it's a, for some folks, it's simply something they never conceive of, you know, yeah. the, the, the need to be still. Because we don't 
rely on nature directly anymore. We rely on grocery stores, so we mm-hmm. don't know how to, to stock, whether with the intention of killing something or just observing it. Or taking we a picture. Yeah. We don't. Yeah, we don't learn that anymore. Yeah. So, so, you know, folks can think about hunting with a camera. Um, it can be like that. Yeah. Instead of hunting with a gun, hunt yeah. with a camera. Exactly. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, that's interesting. He said he's got a – he takes about – it takes him about one minute to take a step when he's doing something like that. Mm-hmm. Pretty amazing. Well, it is amazing. It is. That's, that's patience. Yeah. Something that we lack in society. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, we want it and we want it now. Yeah. And what do they cover in the ecology class? Um, some of the basic concepts. Um, it, there's a lot of terminology involved. Um, it's helpful to learn terminology only as relates to future study. Terminology, especially in in ecology, is a shortcut. If you you know if you understand the concept distilled down to terms, then you can move faster through the the book study part of it um, and get out there into the field to to actually observe it. Mm-hmm. So um, when when I personally lead uh, ecological concepts, I I prefer rather than the PowerPoint or the book to go out into the field, usually start by taking the group out, finding a nice little opening in a forested area somewhere, and tell them, go stand by a species. And mm-hmm. sometimes there's a few minutes of confusion as people try to figure out how to go stand by a species. And then as one or two begin to get it and move around and find something to be next to the rest of them catch on. And then we move from there, you know, move through the terminology of ecological concepts. Mm -hmm. Like what are some of the concepts? Uh, Well, so basic terminology, species, populations, communities, um, talk about uh, interactions, um, abiotic and biotic, uh, elements of an ecosystem, um, things like that. Mm-hmm. And then for more Moving information. through how things connect, yeah. And then it's of course, all informational at that point. Yeah, for more information, folks can look, you know, like, um, look at the materials, go through the Texas Master Naturalist Program, and then I've got um, earlier podcasts, um, first interview Episode number two, we talked to Jim Fordyce, a professor at University of Tennessee. He talked about ecology. And then in another episode, we talked to um, Kelly Norid. He's with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And we get into that a little bit, some ecology. So um, folks can listen to those episodes also, learn a little bit more. Um, Absolutely. Kelly's terrific. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I went to... I first like learned about him. I don't remember how many years ago when he gave a presentation on snakes at uh, Washington on the Brazos State Park. Might have been in a December. I don't recall, but that was really interesting. Yeah, he also is quite the alligator expert. Oh, cool! I have to talk to him more about that next time he's on. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um. And so, let me see, kind of to review. So the program starts, you say, um, in like February or March, and runs March, until March. Yes. Mar- okay. It runs yeah. until. And we, uh, there, the interest has grown here in Montgomery County to such an extent that um, we may actually be approaching class size limit right now. Hmm. Wow. So uh, anyone who's interested would probably benefit by checking into it sooner rather than later. Our chapter only offers one the one long training session per year, March through July. Other chapters, like in Harris County, the Gulf Coast chapter, offers two trainings a year. They're more compressed. They do one in the spring that's 
for example, uh, not specific, but for example, it's 14 Tuesday evenings in a row or something like that with hmm. some couple of Saturday field studies involved or um, the following may be 12 Monday mornings in a row or something similar. So different chapters have different schedules. Mm-hmm. Um, anyone in the Montgomery County area could visit the website, um, and I can give you that website address if you're interested. Okay. Um, I'll like put that and in the as show far notes. As, okay. And as far as um, programs that uh, the Township's Environmental Services Department collaborates with Master Naturalists to offer volunteering training and volunteering opportunities, here in the in the area of the township, um, and, you know, I I'd, I'd welcome anyone's inquiry by email or telephone. Cool. Um, and then, what kind of things qualify for the eight? Is it eight hours of volunteer work every year? Eight, forty hours, forty hours of volunteer work, and eight hours of additional what's considered advanced training. And what so? So the, um, as far as the volunteer hours, those aquatic field studies that Master Naturalists helped me with this year, the invasive work, the growing out the milkweed, um, we've, we're launching a brand new training that's coming up February 22nd here in the township. Uh, it also will be at the Hark building, and it's called the Watershed Project. And so we'll be doing trainings for volunteers who will uh, find projects within the township uh, related to water conservation and other water issues um, described and examples given. And we're uh, wrapping in the opportunity for our trainings and volunteering to also qualify for folks to get certified as Texas water specialists through the Texas Parks and Wildlife Program. So um, that's that's something new, but those hours are Master Naturalist approved as well as um, Texas Water Specialist certification eligible. Hmm. Um, for training, for the advanced training hours, uh, those things that I just mentioned, those trainings I've just mentioned would qualify for advanced training as well as say someone at oh Houston Arboretum is doing a class on um, Texas native snakes um, master naturalists who attend that presentation could count that as advanced training hmm. um, say Kelly came to our chapter meeting and gave us a presentation on alligators then that would qualify as advanced training hours um we've had folks come and talk to us about um plants animals all kinds of interesting things program projects so um it's once again the 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 bottom line as far as approvals for training or volunteering hours comes down to uh, natural resource related what about for like um, advanced hours, continuing education kind of stuff, what about reading a book? So reading a book may be personally enriching, but it's an isolated case where there's no um, there's no interaction, so that would not qualify as advanced training. However, if a group of say three to five master naturalists all got together and read the book as a group, discussed passages, uh, had conversation about the meaning and the application, what they could take away from it that would help them become better master naturalists, then it would be advanced training. But for one person to read a book is not. The same applies to, there are tons of webinars available. Mm -hmm. You can watch it. If you watch it live, so that there's interaction going on, it could count as advanced training up to a point. Hmm. But if 
if you want to watch a webinar that's in an archive somewhere, again, if, if a group gets together, they watch it together, they discuss it, they find ways to apply it to projects and programs that they want to participate in, then it, that could be advanced training. And so let's say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, let's say some folks read a book um, and so the time reading wouldn't be counted, but if they read a chapter and then discussed each chapter for like an hour, would every hour count? Yeah. It? Yeah, so they could read a book and let's say, since we talked about it earlier, let's say hypothetically you read Walden and you discuss each chapter for two hours and let's say there's 20 chapters, so that could be like 40 hours total. It, the potential is there, but there has to be a way that what you learn is, is applicable to your role as a master naturalist. Mm -hmm. To find a way to apply it. So we talk about this chapter in this book that explained how some process occurs. How could I apply that as a master naturalist? Now it's advanced training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I can I replicate what was done in this book, this chapter on something in this book? Can I apply that to a project or a program I'm working on? Mm -hmm. Did it help enhance my skills or abilities or knowledge in a way that makes me a better master naturalist? Mm -hmm. Then then it could be counted as training. And something like that, you'd have to get approval for first to, for it to count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a there's a, a chair or a committee who you would say, I want to do this, and they would approve it or give you whatever the constraints may be. Um, there's a chair for a committee on volunteering, and you would say, I want to do this project, and they would approve it or give you any constraints on, you know, time frames or parameters mm -hmm. okay um kind of similar thing with volunteer hours yes you can come up with a program of your own but you got to have it approved yeah cool exactly so it's it's just so that we're all on the same page uh, in the end it is an honor system mm -hmm. um you're going to report what you do on an honor system. So it's just one little level to help you make sure that your thinking about what you want to do actually fits with the program's goal of yeah. creating well-trained volunteers. And they've got to be Texas master naturalists, so maybe one can go to Costa Rica and become a world's leading expert on some poisonous frog there, but we don't have the poisonous frog here in Texas, so it doesn't count towards Texas master naturalist that's correct it's <laughs> personal enrichment but it's not applicable for training um yeah. and there uh, you know and, and once again it's um it's about being reasonable it's you know be sensible be reasonable think it through if if, if projects and programs here that we're going to be working on have nothing to do with that just as you said have nothing to do with that poisonous frog then it, it's not helping me be a better Texas next semester. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Cool. <clears throat> so, um, hmm. So I think we covered what the program is, what the training's like. It's different in different areas. Um, so some folks might have difficulty because of work, maybe doing a Monday Tuesday thing, but in the Heartwood you got Saturdays, and that could help some folks a lot. Um, or if they have an unusual schedule, some folks might have Monday off then and got to work Saturday, and then the Mondays might be better at a, in a different chapter. But um, it's legit to kind of cross-train like that, like if someone's in greater yeah. Houston, but they can't make Mondays, and they can go up to Hartwood. Yes, exactly so. And say our classes, we originally wanted to attract teachers. And we also wanted to attract um, younger folks who still were working. Let's face it, a lot of volunteers across the board, not just master naturalists, but all kinds of volunteers, tend to be retired folks. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to diversify and get um, a, a you know 
more young folks, more different folks who have different things going on in their lives. So we chose to have classes on Saturday. But we're going along and say we get to the fourth Saturday's class and you have to work and you can't make it. If you're, if you're available a couple of Mondays from them, from then and the Gulf Coast chapter is having that same hmm. class or very similar class on a Monday and you can go to that, you can make up your missed class with us by going to their chapter for theirs. Oh, cool. Hmm. It's always best and p- polite to inquire whether they have room and they, mm-hmm. you know, have any objection to your attending their class. Usually what happens is you'd come to us and go through the training uh, committee chair and he would make that inquiry for you. Do you mind if I send okay. one of our master naturalists in training to your snake class on Monday? You know. Cool. What other ways can people go, like how else can people make up a class if they miss it? So um, you could you can attend some presentation somewhere on a very similar subject. Um, say, for example, the Woodlands Hiking Club invites someone to come and talk about mushrooms as decomposers, and the ecology class that you missed was on decomposers. You could go to the hiking club presentation hmm. and report that as makeup for the class you missed rather than reporting the hiking club presentation as advanced training. You can't Mm -hmm. report it both ways, Mm -hmm. but if you need to make up that class, then you report that presentation as class makeup rather than as advanced training. And then I'm sure the chair and other folks in the program would have some recommendations and they've got some connections so they could um, recommend some people or things to do to make up a class. Absolutely. And typically the uh, the chapters that are, that are in this surrounding area, we usually, right before start of class sessions, exchange our agendas or schedules for classes so that um, all the training officers know what other chapters that are very nearby have what classes when and, and do that exactly as you said. Hmm. Refer okay. each other back and forth. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, so... Hopefully that helps folks know a little bit more about the program and the training and how it benefits us and how it's good for our ecology, what we can do. Um, So basically, the Texas Master Naturalist Program is about restoring, conserving, and education. Yeah. Cool. It is. And we talked about plenty of things that you do. any last words for folks about the program or getting involved or anything like that? Well, I've been a master naturalist for 19 years. Um, I think it's been the most rewarding thing I've, I've done in my life. It's been the time it gave, gives me the opportunity to be out in nature with a purpose. Mm-hmm. I've always been out in nature, but this gives me um, a purpose that feels really good. I, I feel as though I am contributing in, in some ways. And I've, I've so thoroughly enjoyed it that I would heartily recommend it to anyone with a love of nature. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've been to some of um, your presentations, some of your talks and walks out in the woods. Um, so they've been good. They've been enjoyable. So folks have opportunity um, if they see the Woodland Township is doing some stuff and um, Terry's given the presentation, then I'd recommend you know, checking it out. You're very kind. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, cool. So um, hopefully that helped folks um, informed us about the Texas Master Naturalist Program, what's involved and how you can get involved in it and what you can do. Um, and uh as we said in the episode, um, we'll have some stuff in the show notes. Or if you want to contact Terry, you got any questions, um, you'll be able to do that. But uh, hope you enjoyed it. And, um, you know, get outside. Enjoy it. It starts with getting out in nature and 
valuing it and understanding it in the first place. So get out and enjoy. Um, so thanks here, again. Here. Yeah. Thank so, you, Michael. Okay. Talk to you all soon, folks.